Okay, so uh, last time we uh, started talking about uh, obviously nuclear chemistry, um, <clears throat> and we talked about some differences between say nuclear reactions and sort of your basic uh, chemical reactions. Remember in sort of nuclear reactions, there really is sort of no uh, conservation of elements uh, like we have in sort of a regular chemical reaction. Uh, and that's really because of sort of the differences that occur in terms of sort of the reactions that are happening. Um, when we're dealing with chemical reactions, sort of traditional chemical reactions, uh, it's really all about sort of the electrons and bonds and bonds breaking and sort of remaking uh, new bonds. And that gives you that sort of conservation of those elements, which is why, again, when we sort of balance a regular sort of chemical reaction, uh, we use those coefficients to make sure, you know, if we started uh, with five nitrogens on the left-hand side of the arrow, we should end up with five nitrogens on the right side of the arrow. Uh, they may just be in some different location or bonded differently, uh, but we do have sort of that conservation of those elements. And that's very different than in nuclear reactions. In nuclear reactions, we actually have uh, those kind of uh, guys in the nucleus, our neutrons and our protons that are actually changing. And as we know, protons, which are really what determines sort of what element we're dealing with, um, if those do change, uh, then obviously we get a new element that's formed. So we do not have that sort of conservation of sort of elements, if you will, because of that, because of what's happening here. And these reactions are pretty much within the nucleus. And that's sort of what makes the determination of uh, what element you're dealing with. But what we do have in sort of a nuclear reaction or equation, as we talked about in terms of balancing, is we do have conservation of both the mass number and the atomic number, which means, again, we're not really creating or destroying sort of things in that sense. Um, we do have sort of conservation of our total numbers of protons, neutrons, and those type of things. And what that really means is when we sort of balance nuclear equations a little, a little bit different than the traditional chemical equation, uh, we basically just need to make sure two things uh, on the left-hand side of the arrow, all the mass numbers, which are those guys that are up on top here, uh, for example, over here, right? this would be our mass number. We could get the thing to get up there, maybe there you go. So our mass number here, like on top, uh, on the left-hand side needs to equal the mass number on the right-hand side of the arrow when you add them all together. And same thing with the sort of atomic uh, number, which is our bottom number there. Again, it needs to match everybody that's on the uh, right-hand side of the arrow. So these, if we look at these sort of DK series ones that we did, but these are individually are obviously balanced nuclear equations. And if we look at this, we got 238 on the left and 234 and four is 238. So that's balance 92 on the left, two and 90. Again, given us our balanced nuclear equation. So we wanna make sure that that is the case. Uh, we talked about really kind of two ways that you're sometimes given these type of problems. Uh, one is uh, an equation such as ones that are written on the screen there, but maybe something's missing. And in that case, what you wanna do really is kind of attack the uh, atomic number first. The atomic number will typically tell you the element that's missing, right? And that's because everybody has their own atomic number on the periodic table. So you could go to the periodic table and find the missing element. Uh, then you can basically add up our uh, missing mass number that's present. Remember that it could be a particle and perhaps is missing. Uh, so we saw some symbols for things like protons, neutrons, uh, beta particles, um, alpha particles, positrons. And again, they carry their own sort of uh, mass number, atomic number combination there. So balancing our nuclear equation is not too difficult in that sense, uh, really just sort of adding. So, you know, that in a periodic table is really sort of important. We then talked about uh, some stability and nuclear stability. And there's a couple of different ways we could look at stability. But one sort of uh, important way is what is sometimes referred to as the N to Z ratio. The N to Z ratio is the number of neutrons to proton ratios that you find uh, within a nucleus. And basically, depending on the number of protons that are there or the atomic number, so for example, uh, guys that are one through 20 should have a good ratio of one. Um, and then, you know, 1.25, 1.50, as you kind of go above that 20 to 40, 40 to 80. Um, and if we don't have that sort of 
stable ratio, what will happen in these guys is they will go through a DK process, right? And when we talk about DK process, that usually involves some type of uh, radioactive particle, like an alpha particle, beta particle, or something like that to be sort of given off. Um, and they will sort of either be kind of too high or too low. So again, they'll try to convert some guys and kind of bring that ratio down if they're too high uh, and vice versa through like a beta particle. And if they're too low, they'll kind of bring it up through an electron capture or a positron emission. And uh, again, as we saw in a couple of examples, sometimes just doing that one sort of decay process will move you to sort of a perfect sort of ratio. Other times it will not move you to a perfect ratio, but will move you to being closer to that perfect ratio um, based on what is formed. Another important couple of things about stability was that we saw at the end there, uh, really the, uh, the protons and neutrons and sort of whether or not you have an even number of those or an odd number of those guys. And basically even even uh, is basically the ideal situation that's where you have a majority of all your stable sort of nucleides. The worst situation would be the odd, odd sort of uh, proton neutron guys. And that's where you'll end up with uh, sort of your least number of stable nuclei. Like there's only five of them sort of has that sort of configuration. We finished up talking about what we see here on the screen, which is a DK series. And a DK series is that process where you know, we have sort of a unstable nuclei uh, that will basically continue to go through basically a series of nuclear decay processes. And eventually they'll keep going until they really get to some type of stable nucleus. And then they'll sort of stop at that point. Um, and again, it could be, you know, alpha, alpha, beta, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, depending on what the, the process is there. And we talk about really two ways that you can uh, sort of determine or figure out what's happening. You could do it like I did there on the right here and pretty much uh, kind of just do it step by step. And step by step means that basically you do the first sort of DK process. Whatever you end up with is your starting guy on your next guy. And again, you follow that pattern. This guy becomes your starting guy. And again, you could basically just run through them remember that when we talked about sort of words and stuff like that, uh, if it decays through this process or emits something, those particles will be found on the product side. Remember electron capture means that guy's gonna be on the reactant side, or if you bombard something, it's also gonna be on the reactant side as well. The other way you could do it is again, maybe you wanna check yourself or maybe you're not really interested in what is being formed at each of these steps along the way. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with alpha and beta sort of decays, for every alpha decay, you basically could subtract four from the mass number, which is what we did here. We had two of them in this example, and two from the atomic number, which are those two. And you also could add back one to the atomic number for every beta, which represents the two beta ones that we had. And you can see you could just kind of bypass and get to the end there if you want and figure out what is uh, going to be formed. Any questions on that stuff that we talked about last time there? Yeah. So here is actually a DK series for sort of like the one we did there, um, but it's uranium-238. And you can see it goes through a, a DK process here. It actually splits off at some point, which sometimes happens with uh, radioactive DK or nuclear DK. Um, you know, sometimes it's not so predictable in terms of what you'll get. Um, but here after say this run here, it typically will split either this way or sort of this way. Um, but the regardless here, as you can see it's sort of the first ones here, they continue down, they continue down. And then you have that sort of splitting, but they do all sort of end up in the same location there at lead 206, uh, which again is sort of a stable nuclei. So again, basically what you start with and what you produce, then you start with that guy, what you produce, start with that guy and produce and keep on following. Again, uh, the parent there, the original daughter nuclei afterwards as you continue down this series. And as you can see in this case, it can be a number of sort of steps along the way until it sort of hits something that is uh, relatively stable. 
Now, what we're going to talk about next is uh, radioactive decay and nuclear chemistry. And the good news about that is it is kinetics and it is stuff that we've actually seen before. So all radioactive decay follows first order kinetics. So really all radioactive decay follows that first order kinetics. So if you remember a couple of things from kinetics, hopefully uh, first order had a couple of important sort of equations, natural log of A equals the natural log of A naught minus KT. You also remember that the half-life was the natural log of two over K. The half-life, right, is the time it takes for half of whatever you started with to basically go away. So obviously if you started with 10, after first half-life you'd have five, after second one you have two and a half and so forth, uh, continuing on. Now, because it's really first order kinetics and we've already learned these equations here and really how to use them, you can continue to use these equations and you know it'll come out the same. The only difference though is sometimes here in nuclear chemistry, they will sometimes use some different sort of symbols. So instead of sort of A, so sometimes you use N for nuclide, but it works sort of the same way as what we did in sort of first order kinetics. As you can kind of see down here, they use N for nucleide here. Again, initial and final sort of guy. Um, not really shown here, but sometimes as well, uh, they will, this is what is referred to, usually we talk about it as the rate constant when we're doing kinetics. This is sometimes referred to as the decay constant when we're referring to sort of nuclear chemistry. And in some cases, we'll see it here in a second, some cases they'll actually use the lambda symbol uh, to represent that as well instead of K because they're nuclear chemists, they like to have their own sort of uh, symbol sometimes. So sometimes you'll see this equation, the natural log of N is equal to the natural log of N naught minus lambda T. And again, it's basically the same equation as up here and what we learned earlier. Works the same way. Again, the first guy there, the A or the N is your final sort of concentration. You wanna think about it, your initial concentrations Again, your rate constant or decay constant and T again here, a reminder is time. Also a reminder again, that if you take the natural log of two, that is where the 0.693 number comes from. And um, the half-life is equal to 0.693 divided by the decay constant. And again, you can use either of the symbols there as writing um, <clears throat> along the way. Now, something a little bit different than uh, sort of uh, what we've used it or how we used it before does come with the idea of, if you think about back to kinetics, when we kind of use these guys here, these were really a lot of times concentration or molarity. And when we deal with this equation in sort of nuclear chemistry, uh, the units of NRA here can be molarity, which they probably won't be. It could be things like grams, could be things like milligrams. Uh, you could use things like rates. Uh, sometimes very commonly CPM counts per minute, for example. Um, so you could use a lot of different units into here. Sometimes after kinetics, we think about, oh, it has to be like molarity or something that goes in there and it doesn't have to be. So we'll use a lot of sort of different units uh, along the way here. And a lot of times because it is dealing with obviously radioactive decay, uh, a lot of times counts per minute or something like that. Some type of rate is used a lot in nuclear uh, chemistry. But you basically solve them and kind of work them the same way. In addition, we have our same sort of first order plots uh, that we're used to seeing. And here again, as, as I was mentioning before, uh, sort of that use of lambda instead of the k again for our dk constant and remember as we talked about in kinetics if you rearrange that the natural log of n is equal to minus lambda t plus the natural log of n naught 
that is written in the form of a straight line. And that's how we get the traditional first order plot that we see on the right there, as this is y is equal to mx plus b. Again, on the y, our natural log, and on the x there, our t. And then just like in kinetics, if you take the slope of that line, it will equal minus the decay constant, okay? And uh, remember that the line here is gonna be negative. The negative and the negative here will turn our DK constant like our rate constant into a positive number. Any questions on that there? So when we talk about half-lives, obviously some things have, you know, pretty long half-lives. Some things have very short half-lives. The shorter the half-life, right, the quicker something will be sort of gone, if you want to think about that in terms of radioactivity. It will decay a lot faster, right, as opposed to something that has a very long half-life. It will take a much longer time for it to go through that decay process here. Uh, so TH232, for example, has a half-life of 1.4 times 10 to the 10 years, and it's an alpha sort of decay process. That means none of us will ever see one of those half-lives ever. Same thing with uranium-238 has 4.5 times 10 to the nine years as its half-life. So that is a long time for half of whatever you started with to basically go away. Uh, Carbon-14 is 5730. But you can see some things like at the bottom here, um, RN-220 is 55 seconds or so. And TH219, even though these guys are the same element, right? The differences in sort of the neutrons there makes a very big difference, as you can see here, in terms of the half-life. This guy, you know, 0.00000, I think one more, uh, 105 seconds. So that's a very, very fast uh, sort of half-life. So again, depending on sort of uh, what isotope present, you could have a long half-life or short half-life and does create some problems as we'll talk about a little bit later on here uh, in terms of what to do with some of this stuff obviously for that much time period so why don't you take a sample here and give a go uh what is the uh how much of that guy will remain in milligrams if uh we have 1.35 of plutonium 236 calculate the mass that will remain after five years and we'll give you perhaps the half-life here. The half-life is 2.86 years. I think that's what you need. All right, so why don't you give it a go and see what, we'll what you end up with. How much should be left over after five years if this guy has a half-life of 2.86 uh, years. So, Again, the nice thing about, I guess, radioactive decay is, uh, you know, you don't have to think about, you know, is it first order, second order, zero order. It's always going to be first order uh, when you're dealing with these type of problems, which obviously means that we know sort of the two equations that should go with it. And, you know, you can still use these sort of same symbols if you want from what we learned in kinetics. Um, If you want to use the new symbols, you can. They're basically equal to each other. So let's think about what we do have here. Uh, if we have uh, 1.35 milligrams, that's sort of our initial concentration here. We're looking for sort of what we end up with. Uh, we do know that we're going to go for about five hours, uh, five hours, five years. Uh, so if we look at this, we got uh, this, uh, we're looking for this, we have this, we are missing really the decay constant here. And this is where sort of our half-life equation comes into play. It's very common, these problems that you have to use them both together. Uh, so we could do that because we do have the half-life that was given to us. So we could use the half-life obviously to solve for our decay constant. So that really is what we want to kind of do first here. So the decay constant would be the natural log of two divided by the half-life, which would give me the natural log of two uh, divided by, looks like 2.86 years is going to give us, uh, let's see here, 
Touch log of two, 2.86, Point 0.242. The units here are reciprocal years. So one over year. So if you remember as well, what are the units of the DK constant or rate constant for first order is one over seconds or one over a unit of time. So that does make sense there, right? It's all sort of following correctly. Now that we have that, we now have everything that we need to basically go into our equation. This will give us our natural log of A is equal to our initial. And again, here, we don't need it in concentration. We can leave it in milligrams uh, minus the DK constant we just saw. And if you don't put an extra zero in there, that would be good. All right, try that again. 242, one over years. And also something else that we talked about when we did kinetics as well is the units of these two guys, right? So sometimes they are different. In this case, they happen to be the same and they do cancel out, which is good, but you do want to watch that again, like normal may not always be the same units. So you do need to get them into the same units. And if we put all that in here, it looks like uh, we end up with the natural log of A is equal to minus 0 0.909895-ish. And at that point, uh, it looks like, just make sure I punch that in there correctly real quick, times five. And now to get rid of that, we're going to take the E of both sides there to get rid of that. And if we do that, that will then get us, uh, looks like we'll call it 0 0.40. And the units here will be based off of the units that we had for our initial concentration, which is milligrams. So these would be milligrams. It does also make sense, right? We started with 1.35 milligrams when it's over here after it went through some decay processes we should end up with obviously less than what we started with otherwise you're going in the wrong direction it's not decay any questions on any of those steps there again pretty identical to sort of the kinetic sort of stuff that we did earlier here i right, want you to try another one here and see what you come up with uh we got radon 222 uh assuming that no loss from leakage if there is 10.24 grams of it in your house today, how much will be there in 5.4 weeks? Looks like the half-life is 3.8 days. So see what you come up with. Okay, uh, so let's take a look at this one here. So again, uh, right off the bat, we know uh, Again, we're dealing with our first order. And again, uh, we're assuming that we are starting with uh, 10.24. Uh, we want to know how much will be there after 5.4 weeks. And that would be this guy here. So just like before, and again, very commonly, uh, we need to use this guy uh, to figure out our DK constant. So if we do that, it will be the natural log of two divided by our half-life, which in this case is the natural log of two divided by 3.8 days. That is going to give us the natural log of two divided by 3.8 days, 0.182. Again, units are basically reciprocal days in this case, or one over days. This is also what I was talking about before though. We do have a situation for these two units here in this particular problem. Here we have days and our time is in weeks. So you do need to do some type of conversion. You could have converted uh, the 3.8 days into weeks or you can convert, like I'm going to do now, the 5.4 weeks into days. 
but you do have to do some type of conversion. Otherwise you will be off. So uh, I'm going to do the 5.4 weeks. I believe in one week, there is one day, no, seven days. Seems good. And that will give me uh, 5.4 times seven, about 37.8 days. So again, you need to do that conversion. Otherwise your units will be off. You don't necessarily have to go to days. You can go both the weeks, should come out the same. Um, now we got everybody in sort of the right units. We could go into here natural log of our initial, which was 10.24 units here are grams, um, minus our decay constant, which is 0 0.1821 one over days, times our 37.8 days. Again, this is why it's important to get those in the same unit so that they do cancel out correctly, giving us the natural log of uh, 10 point, natural log of 10.24 minus 0.182 times 37.8. Looking like we end up with the natural log of A is equal to minus 4.5533. We're going to take the E of both sides there, going to give us now so a 0 0.011. And the units here would be the same units that we saw originally there, which would be grams in this case. Also, we see again, the decrease in the amount that we started with, which does make sense again, because it is decreasing or decaying over time. Any questions on any of those steps there? So we could actually use uh, sort of this process as well uh, with what is sometimes referred to as radio dating. And my arrows are all messed up here again. Um, so let me just uh, maybe write them out here. So we can do something like, for example, uh, nitrogen 14. Oh, a carbon 14 there, plus a proton. And we could do like carbon 14 sort of dating here. It will decompose into nitrogen 14 via a beta particle and so forth. It has a half-life of 57, 30 years for a carbon 14. We can also use uranium 238 to sort of do some dating as well. It goes through a process where uranium 238 goes to lead 206. And obviously through that process of what we saw there in that DK series earlier today, um, gives off a lot of alpha particles and beta particles ending up on that sort of stable uh, lead and that has a half-life of 4.51 times 10 to the nine years. So we can figure out how old something is, you know, by how much say carbon 14 is left uh, in a sample versus say, an original sample. We we'll also do some dating to using uranium, again, figuring out sort of uh, how much uranium is left or even how much lead is present in that particular case. So let's take a look at one of these guys here and sort of see how we could kind of use this to do that sort of calculation. So an ancient skull uh, gives 4.5 and this is a unit of really radioactive decay. And again, as we mentioned before, you know, we can use all kinds of sort of units in the sort of first order uh, equations. This is a couple things here just to give you an idea of what the units we're talking about here. This is disintegrations per minute and GC is not actually Celsius, like a lot of people think, it's actually grams of carbon. So this is grams of carbon here. So this is basically how many disintegrations per minute uh, is per gram of carbon is happening. Um, and again here, that's sort of a rate of radioactive decay. 
if a living organism gives you 15.3, how old is the skull in this particular case? Well, first off, a couple of things that are important is this sort of grams of carbon. This grams of carbon tells us that we're dealing with what we just saw really on the other side, uh, which is that carbon 14. And that carbon 14 has a half-life of, as we just saw there, 57, 30 years. So that's why that part of it's important. Also, if we think about, again, our sort of first order law here, our formula, we have uh, 4.5 disintegrations per minute. We have 15.3. So we really have our initial and sort of final concentrations. We want to know how old it is. So we're actually going to be solving for T in this case, which means much like what we saw before, we are missing the decay constant. So again, using the half-life equation, we can figure that out. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out first off our decay constant, just like we did previously, natural log of two divided by the half-life here gives us a natural log of two divided by the half-life again, 57, 30 years coming from the idea that this is per gram of carbon. So that's what gives us that information. And if we do that, natural log of two divided by 5730 gives us a half, um, I'm sorry, not half life, but a decay constant of point, uh, looks like three zeros, one, two, three, one, two, one. And these are again going to be reciprocal years because of the units that are here. So we have two numbers here, you know, what's our initial and what's our sort of final? Well, kind of much like life, right? Living is kind of initial. If you're ancient skull, they are probably not so much living at that point. So that would be your final. So this would be our final here. This guy over here would be our initial uh, because of what's happening. So initially, something should have a lot more rate of decay because there's a lot more of it to begin with and again final here will have a much lower sort of rate of decay and that's how we get our numbers there so using our equation and now putting in what we got going on our natural log of 4.5 is equal to the natural log of 15.3 minus uh, k, which is 0 0.000121 years times t. So what we're going to do now is solve this. We're going to take the natural log of 4.5, going to subtract now the natural log of 15.3 to the other side. And then we're going to end up uh, with minus 1.22378 is equal to minus 0 0.000121 years and t. We're going to divide this now to the other side. And if we do that, we end up with, looks like uh, time will equal 10113 years. Maybe if we are uh, you know, some sig figs here, maybe 101, oops, 101, zero, zero years. About 10,000 years old uh, would be this ancient skull that was found. Any questions on that particular calculation? So again, this illustrates, as I was mentioning, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be concentration, doesn't have to be grams. Again, very common here in sort of nuclear reactions, you follow, it's basically how you kind of do a lot of things is you follow basically the rate of radioactive decay through a process. All right, so why don't you give, I want to go here and see what you come up with here. Archaeologists have found uh, a civilization that's 15,600 years old. If a living sample gives 20 counts per minute per gram of carbon, uh, what is the number of counts per minute per gram of carbon and a rice is found on the site? So why don't you take a couple minutes to see what you come up with. Look at this one. So same idea here. Um, we have a rate of radioactive decay sort of given to us. And again, different than the one we just saw, but kind of works the same way. 
Again, counts per minute per gram of carbon. Again, the gram of carbon is important because it's gonna tell us that we're basically using the same sort of half-life that we just talked about a second ago, which would be our 5730. Um, we have counts per minute for a living sample. Uh, so that would tell us that that's our initial, which is 20 counts per minute. And we wanna know really what is the counts at the end and a grain of rice that's found on the site that has been dated back to a time of about 15,600 years. So much like the same sort of process here um, that we've been doing, we do need to again use our half-life equation here to get us our decay constant that's necessary. And in this case, it would be the natural log of two divided by our half-life which is just the same one as we just used on the previous problem, will come out to the same number in this particular case. Now that we have that, this one is actually in reciprocal years. Our time is also in years, so we're okay in terms of that front. So we actually could just plug and chug into here. So we'll have our natural log of A is equal to natural log of 20 uh, minus our DK constant that we calculated, which is one over years times our 15,600 years. Again, importance of those years sort of canceling each other out, going to leave us the uh, natural log of 20 minus uh, 0 0.000121 times 15,600. Going to get us the natural log of A is equal to 1.10813, taking our E of both sides. Going to get us, in this particular case, looks like 3.03. .03. Now again, the units here are really based off of the units that we see here. So these would be counts, if I spell it right, I'll try that again, counts per minute per gram of carbon there would be our units that would be associated with that there. Question on that particular one there. Again, we do see sort of the proper way it went with our number there. Uh, we started with 20 and then uh, we ended up with 3.3. So something that's been around 15,000 years has probably gone through some decay and we would expect it not to be given off as much sort of radioactivity, if you will, right? Because it pretty much has decayed a little bit of that. So it shouldn't be given off so many counts per minute. Any questions on sort of uh, radioactive decay? Again, the nice thing about that is uh, it pretty much is the same first order stuff that we did in the kinetics chapter. Okay, so uh, if there's no questions, the next thing we're gonna talk about is actually um, sort of where does sort of the energy come from uh, where we have sort of fission take place. So a couple of things about uh, sort of fission, just a reminder, fission is sort of the process where we have a unstable sort of nucleus and it splits off into usually two new nucleuses. And also a lot of times we'll give off some neutrons and a lot of times give off energy. And this could be spontaneous. It can be sort of uh, helped along by shooting a particle at a stable guy that becomes unstable, or this could just sort of happen sort of naturally. Um, there is sort of, during a nuclear fission, there's some of the mass of the nucleus is converted into energy. And what that means is there's sort of a, a difference in the mass of the isotope that develops and the mass of like the protons and neutrons that sort of make up that particular sort of isotope or nuclei. And that little bit of difference gets converted into energy via our good friend here, Einstein's equation equals mc squared um, is equal to mc squared. That obviously is energy. Uh, this is the speed of light, which is our three times 10 to the eight meters per second. 
and M is the mass. And in the case of what we'll talk about here in just a second, um, it is also sometimes referred to as the mass defect in this sort of application. What is the mass defect? We'll talk about it here in just a second, but it essentially is that little bit of difference in sort of the mass of the components that make up um, a nucleus and sort of the mass of the actual sort of isotope as it ends up being, and that gets converted into sort of that energy. One thing that we did talk about before is the fact that in these sort of fission, for example, reactions or nuclear reactions, because again, we're sort of changing those nucleons, right? The stuff, the particles that are found in the nucleus, um, it takes a lot more sort of energy difference, if you will, to make those things happen. So usually nuclear reactions give off or produce a lot more energy than your like very exothermic sort of chemical reaction, which involves just electrons. You can see here 10 to the 13 in like a fission reaction versus 10 to the sixth in a sort of super exothermic type reaction. So because we're dealing with those nucleus uh, and those subatomic particles in the nucleus, we get these very, very big amount of energy sort of distribution that takes place. So when that nucleus forms, as I mentioned before, some of the mass of the separate nucleons is converted to energy. So there is that sort of difference between, again, the nucleons, a reminder, is basically what's found in the nucleus. And those are basically your protons and your neutrons, kind of like your mass number, um, basically. So that difference in energy between those guys is what's going to be converted into sort of uh, the difference in mass of those two guys can be converted into energy. And that difference is what is referred to as the mass defect. And again, that's why I said earlier, uh, when we went into the looked at Einstein's equation here equals mc squared. Again, that m here would be sort of the mass defect in this sort of application here. Now, the energy that is released when a nucleus forms is what is sometimes referred to as binding energy. And nuclear binding energy is the energy basically required to break up a nucleus uh, into its sort of protons and neutrons. Now, there's some conversions here which really do come from sort of Einstein's equation. There are two sort of common units of binding energy. One is joules per nucleon are mega electron volts per nucleon. These are two very sort of common units that are used uh, for binding energy. One mega electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So that is sort of a conversion that you could use between them. One AMU, a mass defect, is equal to 931.5 mega electron volts. Um, and that's also a conversion. So. We'll show you an example here in just a second, but essentially you can choose to do these problems using Einstein's equation. You could choose to do these problems not really using Einstein's equation, even though you kind of are, uh, by just kind of going the conversion route way by using these two conversions. And you can pretty much sort of solve it and end up with the same answer. What is binding energy important for? Well in addition to sort of being that uh, sort of energy is required to break up a nucleus into its protons and neutrons, um, it also is a measure of stability. So the greater the binding energy per nucleon, so either a joules per nucleon or mega electron volts per nucleon, the more stable nucleus is. So this is yet another way that you can sort of look at stability is by calculating the binding energy per nucleon and again, the one with the larger binding energy per nucleon will be pretty much uh, more stable. Any questions on that so far? So let's take a look at an example here as to sort of how we can kind of do this. And let's take a look at uh, this guy here, which is a very badly thing with my thing. So I'll just write it, I think. So the nuclear binding energy, again, is that energy is required to break up uh, sort of the um, guys into their protons and neutrons. So if we put the binding energy in with our, say, fluorine nucleus here, it will break up into the atomic numbers nine. We get nine protons and 19 minus nine is 10. 
which would give us 10 neutrons is essentially what it's going to break up. So if we know that this guy, for example, has, if we know that uh, fluorine 19 here has an atomic mass of 18.9984 AMU, and we wanted to calculate the binding energy per nucleon, you know, how could we go about sort of doing that? And we could go about doing that through this calculation. So first off, sort of regardless of which path you choose, either using Einstein's equation or sort of using more of the conversion factor sort of approach, um, you pretty much need to figure out that mass defect. And that mass defect, again, is the mass of basically the particles that make up the nucleus, so our protons and our neutrons, minus the mass of the entire sort of nucleus or isotope, if you will. And that difference is was the mass defect. So what we want to do is, first off, we're going to need the mass of a proton. And a proton is about 1.007825 AMU is the atomic mass of a proton. A neutron, remember, is a slightly larger, but fairly close, 1.008665 AMU. Those numbers would be provided to you. So what we want to do is first figure out the mass defect. So to figure out the mass defect, it is equal to, since we have nine protons, nine times 1.007825, AMU, so that's for our nine protons, plus there are 10 neutrons, so 10 times 1.008665 AMU, that's for our 10 neutrons, and we're going to then subtract that from the atomic mass of this isotope, which is 18.9984 AMU. Any questions on where those numbers came from? And if we do that there, we end up with a mass defect in this case of 0 0.1587 AMU. that difference in mass between sort of the protons and the neutrons and the mass of the isotope is what is going to be kind of converted into energy. And one way you could do that is to go into Einstein's equation here, this guy being our mass defect that would go into here. That would give us 0 0.1587 AMU times our three times 10 to the eight meters per second, which is the speed of light, which we will square. And if we do that, we will end up with, looks like uh, 1.43 times 10 to the 16. And what are our units here? Our units here are AMU times meter squared divided by second square. Now, remember that the two common units for sort of binding energy are joules per nucleon, are mega electron volts per nucleon. So we are not actually at either of those units at this point, but we could get very close to those units by remembering that a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared second squared. And that is what a joule equals, if you remember. So we have the meter squared and second squared here. We just need to get the AMU into kilograms. So how do we do that? We actually use this guy here, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 26. AMU is a kilogram. You may be saying that sounds like Avogadro's number and you'd be right, it is Avogadro's number, but Avogadro's number is to the 23rd and that's a gram. 
So to the 26 gives us a kilogram, right? That's kind of thousand fold, three decimal plates difference. So that's basically Avogadro's number to the 26, which gets us to kilograms in this case. And if we do that conversion there, divided by 6.022 to the 26, that will then give us 2.37 times 10 to the minus 11. This will now be kilograms, meter squared, second squared, which is a joule. Any questions on that there? Now remember, joules per nucleon is usually a very common unit here. So what we would want to do at this point is then divide it by our nucleon. Our nucleon is the number of protons and neutrons, which is really your mass number. So we would divide this by 19 nucleons and we will end up with 1.25 times 10 um, to the minus 12 joules per nucleon. Any questions on that calculation there? Now, if we wanted it in mega electron volts per nucleon, we could actually just use a conversion factor that we saw earlier. And earlier we saw that um, there is 1 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules in one mega electron volt, which means if we wanted to convert it into the other units, we would divide by 1.602 to the minus 13. And that would give us something like 7.792 mega electron volts per nucleon. So this is one approach that you could do uh, to sort of figure out the binding energy per nucleon. Any questions on that there? So what would be sort of the other approach? Well, the other approach would be, you would start it the same way. You could basically just grab out our mass defect, 0 0.1587 AMU, and we could use some of those conversions that we saw over here that one AMU is 931.5 mega electron volts. And we could go right into that and go one AMU is 931.5 mega electron volts. And that would get us uh, 1587 times, oops, that's 931.5 gives us about 147.8. Uh, gives us about 147.8 mega electron volts, which if we divide it by 19 nucleons gets us, you know, roughly that's where to go. About seven point Seven point seven eight mega electron volts per nucleon, which is fairly close to what we got over there on the other one. Just some rounding, probably difference on those two. There you go. Let's make sure I punched it in right over there. To the minus 12 divided by 1.602 minus 13. I guess it would help if I wrote the right number over there. So that was 7.80 actually, huh? Come here. So if I used a rounded number there instead of probably the non rounded number like I used originally, I end up with 7.8 mega electron volts per nucleon which obviously is close to the rounded number that we got over here. So those are obviously very close to each other. We then could use the same conversion and convert it from uh, mega electron volts into nucleons and using the same conversion, 
1.602 times 10 to the minus 13. This would then get us about 1.25 times 10 to the minus 12 joules per nucleon. So again, you can see you get the same answer. Again, I got a slightly different one because I didn't round and just used the whole number. But if I round it a little bit there, we get a lot much closer uh, sort of number. So those are two different approaches that you could do here to basically figure out the um, binding energy per nucleon. You can uh, either kind of use those conversions and go straight with those conversions after the mass defect, or you could use Einstein's equation there and basically Avogadro's number to the 26 to convert it into joules. Any questions on that there? So again, this sort of binding energy per nucleon is a, a good measure of stability as well. And that's what we see here when we look at this sort of chart. Uh, we see that as the binding energy per nucleon increases, which is going upwards here, we do see actually uh, iron 56 is the highest that we got going on. Um, and again, that's sort of a nice measure of stability. The lower the sort of uh, binding energy per nucleon, the less stable it is in that particular case. And here's just another chart of that as well. And this is sort of the process, you know, in this area where a lot of fission will basically take uh, sort of place. Um, most stable nuclei are in this area here, fission sort of happening to move everybody towards the stableness. I guess it's a better way of putting that. So what's happening in here is where we have most of our stable guys, everybody sort of outside of there, probably not so stable going to kind of go through some fission sort of processes spontaneously uh, to just kind of get themselves again, kind of moving more towards this sort of stable uh, region in this area. All right, so why don't you give this a go, uh, calculate the uh, mass defect in the nuclear binding energy per nucleon in mega electron volts. Um, why don't we also do joules per nucleon as well? joules and mega electron volts per nucleon and see what you come up with. Let me give you some of those numbers there. The atomic mass of a proton and a neutron, you can use those numbers if you like and calculate the joules per nucleon and mega electron volts per nucleon for our carbon 16 in this case. Carbon's atomic number is six, by the way. All right, take a couple of minutes here, see what you come up with. So that basically means 16 up on top. And again, from the periodic table there, uh, number six there on the bottom. That tells us it has uh, six protons. It then should have 16 minus six for our number of neutrons, which would be 10 in this case. Um, and that's important because that will help us calculate the mass defect. So for our mass defect here, uh, we're going to do the number of protons, which is six times the atomic mass of protons. So we'll use the number that they got there, 783 AMU, plus 10 neutrons times the mass there of our neutron. And we're gonna subtract it from the atomic mass of the isotope itself, which looks like it's 16.014701 AMU. That gives us uh, six times 1.00783 plus uh, 10 times 1.00866 minus uh, 16.014701. It gives us a mass defect of 0 0.1189 AMU, we'll call it. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> Okay, so uh, since they wanted both or really want to make electron volts, uh, we'll do that one first. And again, here you could go into Einstein's equation. You could just use sort of the conversions. So what I'm going to do is actually just use the conversions here 
and that's going to give us 931.5 mega electron volts per AMU. And that will get me about 110.7 mega electron volts, which we can then turn into per nucleon by dividing by the nucleon, which is the protons and neutrons, which is essentially the mass number here. So 16 nucleons going to yield me, looks like 6.921 mega electron volts per nucleon. And again, at this point, if I wanted to get me to joules per nucleon, I could just do the mega electron volts to joules conversion, which is a mega electron volt, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. And if we do that, gets you, we'll call it 1.11 uh, times 10 to the minus 12 joules per nucleon. First off, any questions on that calculation there? Now, again, uh, you could have used uh, Einstein's equation there and uh, you could have really ended up with sort of the uh, right uh, conversion there. Uh, let's see here. So, um, so if we take uh, the other approach there and we use E is equal to MC squared, we would put in our mass defect here. We would do our three times 10 to the eight meters per second squared there, 0 0.1189 times three to the eight squared, going to give us 1.070 times 10 to the 16 AMU meter squared second squared. That is where we would then use our Avogadro's number to the 26, get that to kilograms. Going to get us 1.777 times 10 to the minus 11 joules is what that would basically equal. And obviously in this case, we would divide it by 16 nucleons going to get us 1.11 times 10 to the minus 12 joules per nucleon, just like we got above. And obviously at this point, if we wanted to get some mega electron volts, we could do the same conversion, except with we're going to divide by this number. And that's gonna give us something like 6.93. Again, with rounding gonna be slightly off. I guess if I actually use the actual number there, not the whole thing, it might be a little bit better. Uh, let's do that. 6.929 in this case, if I use the rounded number. So again, you can see you could do it both ways. You should get the same answer. Again, slightly different depending if you round or don't round or use the number in your calculator, but it should give you a pretty close to the same number there. Any questions on either way of, of doing it? Okay, so we'll stop here for now. What I think we'll do is we'll do